wanted to welcome everyone to another talk in the new speaker series from the Leon Levy Dental Library at the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine. I'm Laurel Graham, I'm the head of the Dental Library and host of this event. I want to first extend a thank you to our speaker today, Dr. Howard Farron, who has generously fit us into his busy day of being a Renaissance dentist, treating patients, recording podcasts, imagining managing his dental fiefdom of dental town, ortho town, and hygiene town. Dr. Farron has also agreed leave time for questions, so please um, post those in the Q&A, and feel free to post them as we speak, because we want to make this a conversation, um, not just a lecture. Um, his podcast, Dentistry Uncensored, is the most popular podcast available for dental professionals. Dr. Farron has interviewed over a thousand people involved in dentistry, from CEOs of the world's largest dental companies to dentists fresh out of school. Within his archive of shows is a treasure trove of dental history in the making. Dr. Farron has lectured internationally on the business of dentistry since 1990, captivating audiences with his blunt, humorous, and practical insights into the industry's most controversial subjects. His genuine passion for helping dentists provide faster, easier, higher quality, and lower cost dentistry to their patients is what drives him to this day. His ever-expanding presence across social media platforms includes 300,000 Facebook followers, 25,000 Twitter followers, and 35,000 LinkedIn followers, not to mention the 250,000 registered members of Dental Town. And I am one of the members of Dental Town. It's a very interesting place. He is also an engaging interviewer, turning even the most seemingly unrelatable topic, to this librarian at least, into an engaging, enjoyable listen. One might think he missed his calling as the next Larry King, but after pondering his talent as a podcast host, I realized he is merely retooling the gift all good dentists have. Excellent chairside manner. In addition to his interviewing well-known personalities, Dr. Farron is a notable person himself, as Incisal Edge uh, Magazine ranked him among the 32 most influential people in dentistry. So welcome, Dr. Farron. Uh, Dr. Farron, he, uh, he's asked me to refer to him as Howard. So welcome, Howard, and thank you for joining us today. And it's, it's, this is our second talk um, in what has proven to be a popular series. So I really appreciate you joining us today. And uh, who was your first talk? Oh, uh, it was Dr. Ivan Aransky of Retraction Watch. He talks about um, retractions in scholarly publications. Um, and it's actually not a dry subject, as you would imagine. Um, it's very controversial, and some people have actually gone to jail over plagiarism. So that was our first talk. Well, when I think of, uh, well, first of all, thank you for your introduction. And all it really means is that I'm really old. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, Man, from your university, when I think of uh, Penn State, I only think of uh, Annie Koch. And uh, my gosh, uh, you got to have Annie. Is she going to be the next one? Actually, I would love to have Dr. Koch. In fact, that was, I was thinking of her. Uh, yeah, I would love to invite her. So if you talk to her, let her know. Oh, oh my gosh, yeah. I will email her today. Uh, she's just uh, the most amazing entrepreneur. I mean, uh, smarter than a. Uh, my gosh, she is so smart. An unbelievable, um, unbelievable success story. You, sh you guys should be proud of her. So, uh, uh, yeah, well, it, yes, um, I do want to tell you someone's already wished you welcome to Penn. The, a doctor, I'm assuming this is Dr. Tukowski. You may or may not know this person. I know you have a lot of fans out there, so I do want to acknowledge them as they show up in the chat. Uh, and yeah, and, and once again, people can put questions in the Q&A. I did pose some questions uh, to Howard previous to this um, event, so I'm going to refer to some of those. Um, and again, I'm hoping that our dentists among us will chime in because um, obviously this event is for you, and these questions are from my point of view. But my first question is, given the pandemic, everyone's talking about the pandemic today, it affects every realm of our life, just like our teeth and dentistry do. How is the pandemic affecting practicing dentists today? And most importantly, those who will be practicing soon, you know, once they graduate. So referring to our students in the audience, how, how, how do you see this changing from when you graduated, when people graduated in 2019 for that matter? I mean, it's, it's radically changed, I would suspect. Well, you know, um, the way I see it is, um, you know, a virus is a self-replicating mechanism, and you had to have that before you could have any life form, whether it be plant, animal, fungi, archaea, what, whatever. And so these viruses were here before you and me and mushrooms, and they're going to be here afterwards. And, it, um, you know, humans is a very old species. Uh, well, you know, 200,000 years 
in the last 200,000 years, I think 110 billion humans that look like us have come and gone. And when I got out of school in uh, 1987, um, that was my first uh, rodeo with the virus. I mean, we had the AIDS pandemic, the HIV pandemic, and uh, it, it got um, it wasn't even mentioned until 1979. And by the time I got to dental school, um, it was a full-blown uh, pandemic that went on to claim 36 million lives. And I want to remind you, they just got a cure for that now, 40 years later. And um, so, you know, it was it's so funny um, being old because you see everything for the second time. And I remember I was from Wichita, Kansas, and the dentists there in Kansas were told that they had to start wearing gloves and same stuff. I'm not wearing a mask. I'm not wearing a glove, you know, all, all this crazy stuff. Um, but but, but we adjusted for that and we got rid of um, cuspidors and we wore gloves and we, we got this whole um, HIV protocol where uh, no one has contracted HIV at the dentist. Uh, I know there was at a um, David Acker in Florida, but that was an intentional thing, they believe. And um, so all those things we did, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And then in 2012, when the last uh, SARS outbreak uh, hit the United States, it killed 38 million souls. Uh, but the dentists didn't care because it was all pigs. And um, but when you go over to Asia where they had SARS, um, that was their their second rodeo after HIV. And they really changed their protocol. So then 2020 comes along and they had their protocol. They, they went through this eight years ago. We're going through it today. We're, we're newbies. This is our um, this is our virgin uh, virus aerosol. And um, you got to remember when HIV came out, everyone would always say, could you imagine if this wasn't an STD, but in the air like a common cold? And uh, sure enough, um, it, it happened. So we were already really prepared for this and they shut us down that was a really bad branding mistake because it made us look like that we weren't doctors you know real doctors needed the mask they're in the hospital and the dentists weren't real doctors and uh that that was that that, that was a tough call it, it just happened stuff happens and that happened it and uh, I, again though too they shut down i know in pennsylvania that we were shut down and then you know, they, they, I know had people in dentistry said, well, no, we, we need to treat our patients. We need to, for one, keep them out of emergency rooms. So that's happening again. Yeah, but I, but I, I, I think of France and England are right now doing lockdowns again. Um, yeah. But I, I think if the United States comes to a lockdown again, I, I understand bars and gyms, uh, yeah. you know, and uh, I just prefer bars anyway. I never even knew there was a gym in Phoenix. <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't think they're going to even attempt to close down the dental office. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, we're acclimating. And, and what the true serum is going to be is, you know, some dentists are putting in negative air pressure rooms. Some, some of the protocols are extreme and you're not going to know what's what's real until five years after this pandemic's over, what are we still using? Like the HIV pandemic, um, you know, we just came to this uh, uh, treatment 40 years later, but um, all those protocol things we did, we, we still do. And uh, airplanes, uh, um, same thing with airplanes. If you go on a cruise, I remember the first time I went on a cruise, I learned a lesson that you don't pick a cruise on where it's going. You pick a cruise on the, the how old is the boat? And I got a boat so old, no one on the on the cruise ship thought it could float. And uh, so from that point on, you know, I'd say if the year was 2010, I'd say, you know, uh, boats launched in 2010 and try to find that boat. And, uh, you know, so um, these airplanes after that 2012 incident in a uh, Asia, um, they started um, changing the air filtration to instead of recirculating it, sending it out or putting in different mask filters. So all these things are going to make us stronger. And I want to say one thing about the vaccine, because I think history always repeats itself. You should know that more than anyone. I love your dental historian knowledge and, and all the dental history stuff you have. Um, but um, my gosh, uh, you sit there and look at this. Um, um, when I got, I can remember my first flu shot. And I remember saying, the, the uh, guy said to me, he goes, uh, the doc said, uh, now remember, this is just influenza. This isn't for the common cold. And I said, well, why don't they have one for the common cold? And they go, oh, oh, they're on it. It'll be next year. 90% of these colds are uh, rhinoviruses and 10% are coronaviruses. And they're going to have that by next year. And then it was next year. And it was next year. Remember, in dental school, they were telling us that, you know, you might have made a bad idea becoming a dentist because they're this close to vaccinating streptococcus mutans, P. gingivalis. Here it is 40 years later, nothing. And um, so when I see all these non-scientists, non-healthcare workers and young people getting all excited for the vaccine, I mean, you can go onto YouTube and talk to virologists that are as old as me that have done this for 30, 40 years. And they say, 
they say, man, we, we, We've been on this for 40 years. Every time we get a great idea, it just doesn't work. So the thought that the, um, you know, the first time we ever get a vaccine for the common cold, coronavirus, coronavirus is right around the corner and it's going to be November 1st. Don't even, I mean, that, that is just ludicrous thinking. And I mean, no respect uh, to ludicrous. I love his music. Uh, I need to get another word for uh, ludicrous, but uh, crazy. It's, it's crazy. Talk to me. Now, do I want to eat crow and be wrong? I want to be wronger than wrong. I, I, I think YouTube should take down my channel if they come out with the vaccine. Um, but my gosh, uh, I'm not expecting it. I don't think it's going to happen. But there is one thing that in game theory that will happen is most of the vaccines in the past couldn't have got um, approved unless they had a 90% efficacy rate or whatever. And, uh, but now I realize if you had five vaccines and each one of them was 20% effective and you gave everybody all five, I mean, you, you could maybe uh, get half the uh, population. So, you know, th this, these are very strange times. And um, I, I think it's actually good uh, for the dentist because I was born in 62. That was the stock market flash crash. So I was born on a bad year. I graduated from high school in 1980. That's when uh, the Fed chairman, Paul Volcker, raised interest rates to 21%. You had double digit unemployment. Um, I graduated from dental school in 87 and black. Thursday was uh, three months later. Uh, then there was the Y2K. Then 10 years ago, there was Lehman's. And a year before this pandemic, everybody was expecting another stock market correction because basically the stock market always corrects. Uh, you know, um, Schum um, you know the uh, Austrian economist Schumpeter in his uh, book, Business Cycles, said the reason you have cycles is because a bunch of crazy people are making all the decisions. And when you got 8 billion wild animals making all these decisions after about 10 years, um, you know, a lot of it um, doesn't turn out to be true. So um, I think it's good for these young dentists because if dentists have a problem, if, if you had to say, what is dentist number one problem? Something in the psyche about dentists, physicians, lawyers, and politicians, they always live be above their means. I mean, you sit down with a dentist, you say, okay, the average house is this side. Is yours average? No, it's above. Okay, the average person, when they go on a vacation, they go to the lake with a, two fishing poles and a case of beer and it costs them 12 bucks. Uh, where was your last vacation? cruise hawaii i mean okay uh online ce on dental town it's 36 dollars a course um it costs you more than 36 dollars to uber to the airport to fly across the country to take a three thousand dollar weekend course and i said just just tell me what you learned at that course that you couldn't have learned for free on youtube just google it on youtube and you'd have found a dentist that um and teaches that um look at their wife's diamond ring you know most wives diamond rings look like it came out of a fruit loops box and their their wives always have you know three carrots four carrots. I mean, they just, they, there's not one area they can live below their means. And whenever you find a dentist that lives below their means, uh, my gosh, that's, they, they retired in this pandemic. Cause look at the classified ads on dental town. We've had 5,000 classified ads for looking for a job and 1,000 selling their practice for the whole 20 years of dental town. Now it's 2,000 dentists selling their practice and only 1000 jobs. And those are all DSOs. So, and so who, so a lot of these dentists, when this whole pandemic broke out, they said, well, I'm, I'm hell, I'm 60. I'm not going to go through all this. I'm, I'm done. Well, why can they retire at 60? Because they, didn't get divorced. So, so when, you know, when you look at student loans, a lot of your dentists are saying, well, I'm coming out of school $400,000 in student loan debt. Dude, my, my divorce was $3.8 million. If you take, uh, and I know I should memorize this number by now because it's so, uh, uh, if you take $3,800,000 divided by $87,000 of student loans when I graduate, my divorce was 43 times more costly than, than, than my dental school. So it's not your student loans. It's the spouse you pick. Remember the number one cause of divorce is marriage. And when you listen to any financial planner, um, they don't tell you the two most important things. If you get married, you get divorced. If you have kids, you have all this college expense. So dentists should just lo live below their means. And when I look at those dental students coming out um, with all that student loan debt ratio, I mean, basically the, um, the, um, 
Oh, what's the name? The American Dental Education Association says the average dental graduate in 2017 had two hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars. But that's a bad number because they know what they're intentionally doing. They're they're taking the total class, total student loans, and they're getting a mean number. But they're not factoring in that twenty percent of those kids don't have any student loans because their mom and dad's a dentist. Uh, but the average cost of raising a child in America um, to from birth to seventeen, not including college, is two hundred thirty-three thousand. So really, your student loan debt is two children. So my mom had seven kids. I had four. And if I was graduating in a pandemic, I'd, I'd start looking at two. You know what I mean? Uh, so um, just they just need to come out of this thing. And and if you come and the worst dentist in spending were the dentists that graduated from 94 to 2000 when the stock market just kept doubling you. Everybody was making money hand over fist. And when that thing popped, they it was their first rodeo. It looked like they were looking at a unicorn for the first time. So live below your means. And I would rather start out my career in a pandemic than in some euphoric high. All right. Well, I think we're clear on that. We have a better <laughs> dental online matching program for relationships. So people choose a better spouse. And I'm sure that will help um, many dental school deans in promoting that versus, you know, the, the questions about their tuition. So it's not the tuition, it's the spouse. spouse it's the alimony. It's the worst. Al it's, well, okay. let's not hope you ever get to alimony hour. That's the goal is, is you were saying is, you know, yeah. Yeah. And, and let me tell you something about divorce rate that I find incredibly interesting. If you have a postgraduate degree and you marry someone with that postgraduate degree, not, you know, not a four year college degree, but a postgraduate degree in any any specialty and everything. And you marry someone that has that same degree. You only have a 10 percent divorce rate. I mean, it, when two dentists get married, I mean, you can talk about root canals, fillings, crowns, how there's 12 specialties. Yeah, but you'd have to have 12 date nights a month just to discuss each specialty. So well, the, the marriage <laughs> is so much stronger when you're cerebrally educated and come from the same um, um, background. That's so, so if you're in dental school, I want you to look around the class right now and just pick one. Just pick one and say, uh, just, just, just go for it. Marry with your brain. Uh, don't fall for that uh, optical illusion peacock syndrome. Okay. Well, we have a few comments and questions for you. Well, first of all, we have a hello from Dr. Mellerman here, Arnold. Um, Mellerman, I don't know. You... Hello, Arnold. Yes. He says hello. And then we have a comment from a Dr. Collins. He did want to comment that the Acker Bergalis case, according to the CDC, was not likely a case of deliberate transmission, although intent couldn't be ascertained beyond a doubt. So as we all know, we, we have differing opinions in dentistry. So I did want to share that. Um, when you were talking about, uh, I didn't know if you had any comment about that. Um, but when you earlier, when you were talking about, you know, the students and entering in a pandemic situation and, and, and living beneath their means, one thing I have found, because I'm in my prior, in my current position, my prior position, I worked all the time one-on-one -on -one with dentists a lot and have friends that are good dentists. And, and I have one friend in particular, or actually a few, they all have businesses. And I'm wondering, you know, how someone with a busy practice is able and people are able to within dentistry you're practicing it's you know very hands-on but then you're able also to oftentimes this person i'm thinking of has a gym just opened a gym recently has a restaurant and then within her practice she also offers manis and petties to the parent the parents of the children she treats so that the parents have something to do while the children are getting treated but to me that's a lot of business and how are I, I see that a lot with dentists and I'm wondering what the phenomena is there, especially when you graduate from dental school. As far as I know, there isn't a heavy business uh, component. You're not taking, you're not getting an MBA, you know, with your, your dental degree. So, so what's with the phenomena of that? Well, you know, the reason, um, you know, phys Dentists are businessmen because they they own their land, their building. Um, you know they 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 do HR. They they hire fire. You know when you look at physicians, only eighteen percent of physicians are members of the American Medical Association. They're mostly employees. And and by the way, you know when we talk about dentistry, we we use very exact terms of streptococcus mutans. When you're in geometry, you use cosine tangent. You know everything's really scientific. But when you go into politics. All the words um, are used differently around the world, and 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 they they don't really have a standard definition of all these things. Like 
left, right, means various things all around the world. Um, but the original use of socialism actually came from an economist, and it meant that the worker owns their means of production, and that's what they were willing to fight and die for. I mean, it's one thing to own your own land, and the king or noble landlord takes half your crop, but when you don't even own your own land, and you're a landless squatter peasant, and you're growing a crop, and then they still have half of that too, uh, that, that was unacceptable for them. So watching the pharmacists all sell their land and building and go take a job at Walgreens, um, you know, is that a good idea or not? It's a great idea if you don't want to be a dentist. If, you, if you're not the type of person who likes to give orders and you're the type of person that would rather receive orders, it, it's all, all well and said. But um, I think socialism is own your means of production. And uh, I think that um, dentists have always been entrepreneurs. And it was uh, Lyndon B. Johnson who signed in the, the Medicare Act. And I, I remember all the economists saying, oh, my God, the doctors think this is going to be good because the government's going to subsidize their health care. But they're getting in bed with the government. And if you get in bed with anyone, you know what's going to happen. And uh, dentists have stayed out of that um, that room now. But, you know, my four boys have turned into six grandchildren and the circle of life when, you know, when you have six grandchildren, you, you know where you are on the circle and you're, uh, you're not going to be here much longer. So I always think of my, my grandchildren and, and, you know, when my granddaughter breaks a tooth and, and she wants to go to a dentist, but the dentist works for an insurance company or DSO or wall street or whatever, where's my daughter going to go when she needs a dentist? And, and uh, dentists have always had one eye on the patient, one eye on cost, and they have to live in a reality because if, if you don't keep your eye on the patient, which if you tell them you need a root canal and a crown, their first thought is, is, is only how much is this? Um, you know, when, they're, when everybody's talking about same-day dentistry with chair-side milling, I mean, for 32 years when I tell people they need a crown for $1,000, no one says, well, can I get it the same day? It's price. And if, when you keep one eye on the patient and one eye on costs and use your use your brain for your five fingers to make everything better faster easier cheaper smaller uh, you give americans the freedom to afford to keep their teeth and these physicians and all these hospitals and big complexes and all this stuff like that. I mean, they're, they're just the farthest thing from a business person. But, so, but, but let's talk about your business friend dentist who um, also owns a gym, a businessman, you know, a dentist, um, you know, I work with my hands. Uh, my two oldest sons are welders on cell phone towers. We all work with our hands. A businessman doesn't really work with their hands. They're more a conductor, a conductor, um, you know, a dentist, when they get out of school, I did this, you know, you, you, you got out of school, you do how to do filling crowns and root canals but you kept taking all these courses and learn how to place implants and sinus lifts and you keep doing all that a conductor doesn't sit there and say oh well we have a song coming up i'm gonna need to learn how to play the violin the clarinet the stand-up bass he doesn't learn all those instruments he doesn't need to know all those instruments he finds the best people to do that instruments like like a lot of people always ask me how do i do it well I, i'm the laziest person at my job i mean um i have 50 employees the whole management team's all been here um you know, a decade is the new person in management and two decades is the norm. When, when you have people that have been with you two decades and Comptroller Stacy, Lori's the president, Ken, the original programmer at Dentaltown, Tom G. Kobe, the original editor of, of um, Dentaltown Magazine, um, you know, Hogo. I mean, you got all these people that are really sharp and have been doing a work for a decade well, what am I going to do? Micromanage? I mean, I, I would just slow it down. So she can do all those things because she's not doing those things. She's a conductor and she's finding the people to do that. And that's what a business person is. And, um, you know, and Dennis and Dennis, Dennis, um, all animals are control freaks. I mean, you obviously don't want to have, you know, a, a grizzly bear walking through your home or your campsite. You're always trying to control everything. And a lot of dentists just think, well, if I'm going to do anything right, I'm going to have to die. I want to remind you that when every single dentist has ever died, the New York Times never had a front page article. This is the day dentistry died. We lost doctor who gives a crap in New York City and dentistry is now dead. Remember that song, The Night the Music Died? Remember that? Uh, it was like a tribute, like Buddy Holly died and people really thought music died. And it's like, Okay, he was good, but uh, have you heard, I don't know, Jimi Hendrix? There's others besides uh, Buddy Holly, but when, when Doc dies, they're not going to stop dentistry. And so you need to look at that whole transition thing and, uh, and be a conductor. And, 
you know, when I go into a dental office, you know, it's just, all you manage is people, time, and money. And the worst thing on building a brand in dentistry is your people turnover because you're selling the invisible. I know this is an iPhone. I know this is bottled water. When I tell Laurel that she has four cavities, well, she should know that. So, like, when I check into a hotel, back when I used to, uh, uh, by the way, I love the pandemic because it got me off the road. I mean, I, I lectured 32 to 64 times a year, 1,000 times, 50 countries. Gosh, I love the fact that I was fired by the pandemic. You know, I couldn't travel anymore, and I love doing the Zoom thing. You can talk to so many people. Uh, it's just so much better. I, one of the things that um, I, I was wondering about, it was – based on you were just talking about the pandemic and how it's changed your role now and you you get to be in house i guess more um what what is how has that changed you what are you more optimistic about in dentistry now i mean we, we've been talking about the problems the challenges the changes you know it, with dentistry different roles dentists take on but oh what, what I don't, you, yeah so, so i i if i came back to me um, oh good the, the people time money is that um um, you know, you're, we, we sell the invisible. Oh, I was talking about when I was flying around all the time, I'd always get in these hotels and, and you figure out the hotel real quick. I mean, why do they put that paper slip around the toilet seat? Um, because they're selling the invisible. I, w- I didn't see the maid clean the toilet. The maid's trying to tell me, hey, this is cleaned. She's selling the invisible. Um, they, they put that plastic thing around the cup. What does that mean? It means that, you know, they, they cleaned it. Dentistry only sells the invisible. They don't know what a root canal bullet and crown is. They don't know the difference between MOD, amalgam, composite, inlay, indirect, and they don't know any of these things. In fact, the Supreme Court agrees because the Supreme Court a century ago, um, everybody's innocent until proven guilty. All the state boards, when they were set up a century ago, uh, they said, well, due to the overeducation of a doctor and the undereducation of a patient, the asymmetry of information is so great that the doctor assumes being an agent on behalf of the patient. So the doctor's diagnosis, exam, and treatment plan is guilty till proven innocent. You have to prove why you took these x-rays. You have to prove your findings, your treatment, all these things like that. So when you're selling the invisible, you can't have a bunch of staff turnover. That's the number one problem with these DSOs. I'm here in Phoenix. It's ground zero for DSOs. 18.6% of all the dentists work for DSO. And when you look at all 50 states, when that long tail slides out, hell, the last five states don't even have 1%. And so they're all here in Arizona. So all the dentists see their patients and they all say the same thing. I'll say, well, why did you leave there? And they say, oh, I thought it was great. They had their own lab. You didn't have to drop off your partial. They relined. It was all great. But dude, every time I went in there, it was a different doctor. I mean, I mean, it was a revolving door. So I just think something's wrong with that place. So, so, you know, they want to build a personal relationship with someone they trust. Now, when you go to Walgreens, I'll never forget when I was lecturing in Paris, France, and this dentist was showing me that when he writes a patient a prescription, he loads it on their smart card. And then they just go to an ATM machine and fill it. And I said, okay, you're, you're drinking, um, you're French. What, you just have a, a bottle of wine, a Chardonnay. That is an uncouth vermouth. I don't even believe it. He went and showed it to me. And sure enough, that machine was made in Scottsdale, right here in my backyard. So when I came home, I talked to him. I said, well, why aren't those in the United States? And he goes, because pharmacies regulated and they pass all these laws that only they can do it. Well, you know, when I get uh, 28 tabs of Pen VK, uh, I'll go to an ATM machine when you're saying, I go to one to get the, they, they give me the $500, uh, the, the quick withdrawal. I mean, you don't need that, but a doctor only does surgery. Only 10% of physicians do surgery, just like lawyers. Only 3% of lawyers will ever do a case in front of a jury. Like all the movies, it's always that big jury decision. 97% of lawyers, they delegate out to that one guy who can do this well on their feet. Physicians are not surgeons. They just write prescriptions and look at diagnostic tests. Dentistry, we live in an operatory. Every patient we touch, we lean back, we give them a shot. They're afraid of getting hurt. Um, you sent me those uh, those videos of uh, Tom uh, Conway um, or um, Tim Conway, yeah, Tim Conway on the Carol Burnett show, and that you know the first thing that you know they're afraid of getting hurt. So so the um, you know you're not you're selling the invisible, and so I'll go to that dentist. I'll say, well, you know what, Doc, you've um, I'll say. If your office could have one thing, one magic bullet, what do you need right now? He's like, man, I need new patients. I'm like, what? 
How many new places do you get a month? He says 20. I said, okay, you're in a town of 5,000 from age 25 to 65. You've been here 40 years getting 20 new patients a month. Hell, you've gone through the entire town three times. And then I'll say, you know, something's wrong. And then I want to look at how long their employee's been there. And sure enough, in the last 40 years, longest employee that ever stayed there was like four years, just constant turnover. And he says, yeah, I hate HR. I'm like, well, then why are you doing it? If I was a conductor and I was playing at a big symphony and I kept saying, what the hell's wrong with that chick on the violin? Oh, she hates the violin. She just hates it. Well, God, let's get her the hell out of the orchestra and find someone who loves it. So I like being a conductor because I like, I love dentistry. My favorite thing is pulling wisdom teeth. Uh, I love surgery. I'm a blood and gut surgeon. I like to, uh, even when I do a root canal, I'm an apical barbarian that wants to puff a sealer at the apex. But if you hate endo, well, we got 4,000 in it on us. You don't have to hate it anymore. You hate HR. Well, let's let's get one of your staff to be in charge of HR. And when you give her this big job description and she's got skin in the game because her decisions are making a difference, she'll be with you 10, 20, 30, 40 years later. You know, when she leaves, when she feels like she's not making a difference, so she doesn't like the people she works with. I'm wondering and now you really it, it, it helped flesh this out for me. I'm thinking it's because it allows you to do dentistry. I mean, if you are, can control your team, because if you're not in private practice and you're in a DSO, you're lo really losing control. But if you have your own private practice, you have more control. You have more decision making in your own dentistry and your actual hands on. So actually by taking on the business, you allow it allows you to practice the dentistry. That's what I'm getting. And yeah, actually, sure. I have a couple of comments, but go ahead. Well, well, you know, you look look at the only dentist on earth who's a billionaire. He's Rick Workman in Effingham, Illinois. You know where Effingham is? I, I'm from Illinois, but yeah, in the middle of Effing nowhere, and. Uh, he hasn't treated a patient in 30 years. Rick Workman, uh, Rick Kirshner, who owns 300 Comfort Dentals, he hasn't seen a patient in 30 years. So some of the some of the dentists um, love the business side and the HR side and people, time, and money actually more than doing a root canal. Um, and I, it, it was a big problem in my growth. I, I knew for 20, 30 years, why am I getting my fellowship in HD, my master's in HD, my you know, all this stuff like that. When I could be, um, I could just bring in a periodontist and have him place all the implants and pay him 50% of um, uh, production. Um, but I was doing it because that's why I wanted to go to dental school. That's, I wanted to do that. But I realized I was doing it um, at the expense of making more money than doing other things, uh, better use of my time for money. But you only live one life and, um, you know, you shouldn't live somebody else's life. If you just want to uh, do dentistry and you don't want to manage anybody, you'd rather just take orders from someone who does that. You got all these DSOs to look at and look at MB2. I think that's an interesting deal. MB2, 40% of their practice owners were former associates. So, so they're, they're voting with their fee. I, I only, um, you know, they used to have all these um, businesses that would interview 10 consumers about a new product that they were going to launch. And they, um, they did this for years and then they stopped doing it. And then they published the social bias. That when Laurel is sitting here showing me the world's greatest Q-tip that, you know, no one, no one's going to use an old Q-tip when they could use the Laurel K. Graham Q-tip. And, uh, and, and, and we don't want to sit there and say, oh, well, Laurel, this is a dumb idea because we like you. We want to be nice. So we tell you what you want to hear. And then Wall Street invests all this money on it. And they go, oh, my God, 100 percent of everybody surveyed loves it. And then it doesn't sell anything. So social bias is very strong. And a lot of dentists are introverts. A lot of them lived in a library all through undergrad and dental school. And they have no interest in HR. So then um, go go work for a DSO. Other dentists, um, they, they're kind of a more controlling, aggressive type personality. And, and this is what the litmus test that I think every dental school should do. You know, the senior class says, well, you know, I'm just going to go get a job, make a lot of money, live happily ever after. Great. It's 2020. Let's roll back to 2015 and see if that's what happened. And you see that when they work for someone else, they change jobs every year. And it doesn't surprise me that the, the richest dentist in the world, his, his dentist actually stayed the longest, and it's only two years. And if you think, well, that's not very good. Well, Facebook, Amazon, app, the Fang stocks, the Fang stocks, Apple, Google, um, Uber, all the they, they, same thing. They only keep their employees one to two years with Amazon, Jeff Bezos being the lowest. He can't even keep his employees one year because he's measuring how much time it takes him to go potty in the bathroom. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a, I don't know, you know, that, that's kind of bizarre and strange uh, in so many different ways. <clears throat> but um, my gosh, um, 
just, just live your own life, do what you want to do. And you may want to be the best dentist in Kansas. You may want to um, be an owner, op, uh, owner operator. You may decide to quit doing dentistry and just be a business person. And, and I'll tell you how, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade, because I'll never forget the most eye-opening experience I had, you know, re- studying business, the thing that blows my mind the most is how when you say to uh, um, any economist in the world, well, what made America the richest country in the world? I go, what do you mean? It was 500 years of immigration from every corner through Ellis Island. And then say, well, when did they close down Ellis Island? Oh, okay. During the Bolshevik revolution, the labor movement. And then, and then you're cutting off this incoming flow of people when they didn't understand the macros. They didn't have internet and all this kind of stuff like that. So the supply of fresh demand uh, stopped. And it took about 10 years to finally the peak, 1929, like something's wrong. It crashed the depression, 32 to 36. And if you ever wanted to make America grow at those rates again, you would open back up Ellis Island. Um, but that's not what the people want to do. People are very good at shooting themselves in the foot. And um, so, you know, what's a um, what's obvious, what's a great idea in what people are going to do are, are very often two different things. Well, um, then pause for a second. I, I did want to acknowledge some of your fans here. We have a, di- a dental student. He wrote a little note. I thought it was nice. I'll share it with you. Hi, Dr. Farron. I'm a second year dental student and I'm a huge fan of yours. I listen to your podcast daily. Enjoy your 30 day dental MBA. And well, there you go. I guess you offer a dental 30 day dental MBA. So I was wrong. They do get to graduate with that and read your book, Uncomplicate, Uncomplicate Business. You are a great inspiration to me and many aspiring dentists. Thank you very much for speaking with us today. Um, so, can you tell can, can, comment, can I make a comment on that? So, yeah, um, I was wondering so, about the book too. Yeah, so, well, let me just tell you my journey first. I was born in Wichita, Kansas in 62. Uh, mom and dad were Catholic, so they had seven kids in three days, and we were so poor. Mom stayed home and made cookies, and dad delivered rainbow bread. He made $11,000 a year, but he lived below his means. It didn't matter that he only made 11000 Mom didn't have a car. They, we never went out to eat. We, um, she sewed all of our Catholic school. Uniforms. I had four of them from uh, you know kindergarten till the end of Creighton, uh, and uh, my gosh, um, he still lived below his means, saved his money, and because he was really excited about that new uh, um, the I um, who was the uh, five star general uh, Dwight D Eisenhower when he came back from World War II and saw the German auto bombs uh, Audubon, he rolled out the interstate system, and when the interstate system infrastructure went out, people started leaving town and going to the next town. And when they got there, they didn't recognize anything, so they didn't want to eat anything. And everybody got the idea: oh, they need a franchise. They need where you can go anywhere on the interstate and find the same bat channel at the same bat station at the same bat time. There's your Batman burger, and all these franchises rolled out. So my dad bought one. It was Sonic Driving when I was ten. In his first year, he went from eleven thousand delivering rainbow bread to sixty thousand. Man, that rocked our world. I can remember me and my sister sitting around like, damn. And then he opened up one every year. By the time he got to five, we moved from the poorest part of Wichita down on 21st and Hillside on Rutan over to Hidden Lakes Estates. And my next door neighbor, Kenny Anderson, the dentist. And I would go to work with my dad, the love of my life, but he made cheeseburgers and fries. And then I go to work with Kenny. Remember, there were no computers, no internet. The the technology today was they were taking an x-ray looking through the tooth and then you get to go on a dark genus and they're developing these x-rays and he's doing root canals it was love at first sight i wrote my dental school uh, letter in the sixth grade asking him how can i become a dentist and uh she wrote me back a letter and told me that i should go to high school and take science classes and uh you know it was just love at first sight so that is what i truly want to do but i watched my dad go from one location to three it was all demographics it was all it was just business and the thing about a franchise is when they open up a new restaurant 60 percent of them are bankrupt in two years but when you open up a franchise 95 percent are still going in 10 years so they worked out the people time and money all the logistics they had it down to a binder and my mom and five sisters didn't want to go with dad to do that and i felt sorry for him so i uh i would go with them and i learned all this stuff but i never thought it would apply to me because i'm going to be a dentist like my next door neighbor kenny and this is something that restaurant franchises do so then it's about senior year of dental school <clears throat> and uh i realized i'm going to graduate so i realized i got to put my sonic drive-in hat on so i wrote the department of economic security and i said um 
where's the jobs growth in America? And they sent me a report that from 85 to 2000, America would create 30 million new jobs and half of them would be in five towns. Uh, one was in uh, uh, Florida. I didn't like the insects. One was Boston. I didn't like snow. I'm embarrassed to say this, but two, Orange County and Silicon Valley in California, when you grow up in Kansas, you're told every day that all the crazy people live in California and they're all nuts and flakes and holly weirdos. And then I saw this little Phoenix and then I looked at the demographics there and 65% of Phoenix migrated in from the Northern Midwest where I thought all the normal people lived at that time. And so I moved down here and then I, um, I wrote the department of economic security in Arizona. And I said, what is your economic projections? They sent me the six year road building plan, the water pipe delivery plan. Um, they, they sent me the 70, 80, 85 mini census. I got a six foot by four foot map. I traced out the 303 census tracts and made an index card for each one of what was the dentist to population ratio. And it ranged all the way from one dentist per 6,000, which is what I went to, all the way down to one dentist for 500. And, 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 and I remember I was so young and dumb. I remember I kept freaking out about what the hell's going on at 6200 South McClintock in Tempe? I mean, I've already got 12 pins in this corner. And that's what I learned about medical dental buildings. And I remember calling um, Roger Carpenter out of Coffeyville, Kansas, owned 100 Sonics, had a jet, just an amazing guy. I said, what's the deal with the medical dental buildings? You think that's a good idea? And he goes, Howard, they got the worst location. Nobody in their right mind would go there with a KFC or a Taco Bell or retail. And the probably the only person dumb enough to go in that location would obviously Obviously, be a dentist, a physician, a lawyer, an accountant, and uh, this, so so they so what they also know is the the great places aren't going to give away much for free. So they'll give you away just enough to kill all your dreams of having a great location and a rocking hot business. And uh, you know, dentist. So I I picked Awatuki. I picked the corner of 48th and Elliott. So the computers were starting to roll out. So I went to uh, um, oh his name was Dave Cheatham. I forgot the uh, Coldwell Bankers. And I asked the guy in Kansas City. I said, do you got any thing in the zip code and he looked it up he's all excited about his new computer thing and he goes yeah there's a safeway complex on there and, I, and anyway long story short i said what do they want and he said well a three-year lease 15 a square foot for three years i said okay well i'll tell you what i'll pay 20 dollars a square foot for five and he goes okay what am i gonna do with all that extra money i said well i'll build out my my deal you built the whole 16 acre center i've been studying math and geometry for eight years i don't know anything about that you build it out done deal then i moved here um health co which later got was out of dallas got rolled into patterson's ipo and i went there i picked out everything i wanted to play all toys in the sandbox and i said how much was it and it was the same amount as my student loan debt it was like eighty six thousand dollars and my student loans like eighty seven thousand dollars i said great well I don't have a dime. So give me all that stuff and put on a 60 month payment plan. And when I pay the 60th month, it's mine. So I got into the most rocking hot demographics, one to 6,000 that was building 90 homes a month and played out just as we expected. No money down. You did that up. through research. I just wanted to point yeah. something out. So as a librarian, that's what's occurring to me is you used research, you used evidence to figure out where you should practice rather than saying, I want to be in this great location, buy this big home and compete for these, you know, there's 500 dentists and, you know, for 5,000 pages, it, it sounded like you used a lot of forethought and I, I would love it for you to said you went to the library, do some research back well, in the day. Um, uh -oh. I, I, want, I want to tell you the biggest lesson I ever learned in the library from Sister Mary Aloysia that I wish everybody would have learned. And that is, I'll never forget it. You know, uh, we were going to do a book report. And I went in there and the first say is, you know, um, say, say it was on Mars. And I based it all on a, a book by Laurel Graham uh, on Mars. And then uh, she looks at me and says, uh, Laurel Graham works for the Mars Candy Bar Company, you moron. I mean, I mean, she, the, the author search was everything. And what the librarians beat into my head in uh, um, Bless the Sacrament, St. Pat's, Bishop Carroll, and Creighton, the Jesuits were fanatics on it is, I'd rather you spend more time on your author search than on your paper. Because the author, hopefully you found the best guy and they've already been doing this 20, 30, 40 years. What are you going to do? Read, read a book? And, and it's amazing now on the internet where you look at the data because I can tell what traffic's doing on downtown. I can tell if you went in that post for a second or a minute. But what is it? 90% of all the forwarded links aren't even open by the person sending them. So it's just a clickbait deal. People don't do author searches anymore. And here's a franchise where I trusted the organization because – 
I had been to Sonic Drive-In headquarters in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, my dad got on by Jim, uh, Roger Carpenter had a hundred, who was brought on by Jim Wilder had a thousand. And, you know, they all had jets. My dad was the, the loser of the group who, he was the only one without a jet. He didn't even have an airplane. I'm like, how embarrassing you know, to grow up with a father who doesn't I even have I don't know how you managed so yeah, I yeah. knew my author search was well because I'd flown in their airplane and they knew what they were talking about. And dentists will say things like, well, you know, if you build it, they will come. Dude, that's a Disney movie. If you looked it up, it even show you the genre fiction. This is not real. And so so humans, um, and I think what humans don't realize, they always talk about how they're the, um, is there an intelligence anywhere else? In your, are we the only ones aware of your existence? Well, I know Dr. Nar narcissist wants to talk about his you know awareness of his own existence but you know, let's get on the other side of the equal sign what would be the opposite you know that addition the opposite is subtraction multiplication the opposite of division what is the opposite of being awareness of your existence and it's being trapped in the present and and in order to be aware of your own you know a dog is looking at a bull a bird you know the ups man is knocking at the door a car drove by. he's just locked in the present but in order for you to think about yourself or be aware of your own existence you you detach from the present and now you enter a fairy tale land and you just have these thoughts in your head and you believe all this stuff. Humans are basically um, the best storytellers. Um, they, they're, they, their fantasy, their genre from Disney to, to magic to, I mean, they're just, they're inch. I love my homies, but my God, they're crazy. And, and all we're and what math does is just say, okay, I heard all about your 32 Disney princes and one slept on 20 mattresses and felt a pee at the bottom, whatever. But I need demographics. You know what I mean? And if demographics don't matter, then here's what you need to do. Go open your dental office in Afghanistan, Syria, Congo. Go play there for like a year. And then call me back and tell me, do demographics matter? DSOs, they only target neighborhoods that have a higher than $60,000 median household income. They, they're not, they're not uh, on some social mission to deliver cheap dentistry for well, the poor. Speaking of which, I, before we go, I did want to address, because it's, 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 I think it's important, and I've seen a lot of charity um, on the behalf of dentists, and, and I wanted to... You just talk briefly on what dentists, have, what you, how you see them reaching out charitably and what work you see that can be done and, and how, I, could you mention lower cost dentistry and as being part of your mission and, and how that plays into this? Um, you know, as being- well, you know, we were having this debate last night. I was with uh, my um, my sister, her husband, you know, a big deal. And um, this, um, this young kid told me that, um, um, I don't know how this came up, but um, remember that, um, um, oh, what was that movie, Grease? What was that? What was that famous dancing guy? John Travolta. John Travolta. And she goes, yeah, well, I already wasn't a good person because I read that Mother Teresa was mad at him because he went and wasted a million dollars and lose losses one night at a casino in Vegas, and he should have donated that to the poor. I'm like, well, my God, that million dollars didn't disappear. That's what's paying all those employees in the deal, and they all have homes and cars. The, the money is a circle, and everything is multifactorial, and we're – humanity um humanitarian dentistry charitable dentistry missionary dentistry where it's the best served is um i've lectured in 50 countries and i'll tell you what they don't look happy in tokyo berlin new york city i mean i, mean, I almost got knocked on my butt by a 60 year old woman trying to get into a subway and then you go to the really poor countries like Kathmandu. and in fact i've been wanting to write a book on it called the giggle factor it's like why are all the poor people so much happier than the rich people and um so the, the you know the bottom line is uh my gosh uh, um when when i went and did my first charity mission i i well, i turned it down i said i don't have time for this and i had all these things going i just opened up an office hell when i find your why and then as far as the development of the charity deal you know flying in there like darth vader for four days and doing a bunch of dentistry then leaving for a couple of years that, that, that is, that's not sustainable that's not economic development so what you need to do which what we do, we, we're serious hard type by that. When we go to an area, the first thing we do is we flush the dentist out of the bushes. Um, there's, um, you know, the the rich companies like Danaher are and Cabo and and Densply. They'll, they'll say there's a million dentists. Yeah, there's a million dentists like you and me. But there's another million dentists that didn't go to dental school, but they're in a town of 5,000. And whenever someone has a dental problem, Laurel does it full time in her hut. And she's That's got a car. Go ahead. 
<laughs> you know, she, she does it full time and you need to connect with that person. And then you need to be able to ship them lidocaine and expired supplies and CE. And then when you go there uh, ahead of time, you're like, well, what, what, what problems are you having uh, with the most? And, you know, maybe it's root tips, maybe it's whatever. And you're like, well, line up 10 or 15 of those and let's show you some stuff. And then every time you'd go there, you realize that he doesn't have those instruments and you brought all those instruments with you. And you're like, I, I don't even want to carry him back and check him on the plane. And then you leave him that stuff. And now you watch that stuff 20 years later. And there are dentists in the bush doing root canals that you'd be proud of. So, so I would make it about, you know, the equal sign, you know, multivariate, you know, it's great. Uh, for you, I, I I realized this when I was little. When um uh, my mom used to always make us do these religious retreats in the church, they'd have like you know, oh Friday you're not coming home, you're going over to the deal. You know, it's a two day retreat, and I'm so mad. But what I loved about it is two days you couldn't ride your motorcycle, play, you couldn't do anything. You just had to sit there and be either listen to Father McGloin, which you know shoot me now. Or just crawl into your own head and be alone with your thoughts. In fact, my, when I was 10 years old, the Catholic Church switched from saying masses and all Latin to English. And my mom thought it was the end of the world. And I loved it because it was all Latin. You had one hour every morning to just think about your day, those 10 questions on your spelling test, just undistracted. You know, you weren't the mouse jumping on the rat wheel and drinking some water and just, just always being busy. I could see how you would enjoy being silent. Yeah, it was tough and you're alone with your thoughts and it was so refreshing that when they went to English, I actually hated that because you every once in a while you'd hear something that you're like, what, what did he say? And it's like, um, it's, it's like me. I had the worst name in school. My name was Howard. Actually, my dad was Howard Eugene Ferran. And he, his best idea was to name me Howard Eugene Fran the second worst idea ever. It was so confusing that dad started going by his middle name, Gene. Everybody called him Gene and they called me a mistake. And uh, my gosh, um, you know, but to sit there and be alone with your thoughts and reflect and decide what you're going to do um, was just uh, the best decision. I, I think they should go back to the Latin masses because no one listens anyway. Well, thank you. And, and thank you for addressing the, idea of, of, of not just dropping into, you know, different, different countries and providing care, but to training the trainers and providing the supplies and, and making it sustainable. And I think that's a very important message. Um, oh, but, oh, but I didn't finish that story with my dad. Oh, so oh, I, I did everything what my dad did. And I opened up my dental office and I started getting a lot of people noticing because this 24 year old short, fat, bold kid from Kansas opens up his practice. It's a million dollar practice right out of the gate. And so people started asking me to talk about this. And I talk about this. And I started to get nervous because my dad taught me everything. And, you know, um, my gosh. Um, so I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to night school and um, um, ASU is only like 10 miles from my office and they had a, you know, their MBA program that you could go Monday and Wednesday night, six to 10 or Tuesday, Thursday, six, 10 or Saturday, every Saturday for two years. And that was when I bought my first laptop. So I went in there and fired up the laptop and I was selfish bastard. I only wanted to take notes about how this was going to affect my today's own. I was in dentistry hundred percent. I just wanted to get formally trained about the business of masters in business of dentistry. So I took notes for two years in my laptop and I loved it because every trimester was two courses. The first course was managerial economics, financial economics. I mean, you know, and, and every time there was a group project, I was told the instructor, I look, I, I only did this for my office. I don't want to do this report on, you know, Starbucks. I want to do it on today's dental. And they'd always let me. And um, I think just to get me to shut up. And when I was done, I looked at my notes and I went into a studio and ranted out my notes and it was 30 hours long. So at the time, Tony Robbins had the 30 day personal power. So I stole that and just called it the 30 day dental MBA. And um, I, um, back then it was on VCR. There wasn't an internet, uh, but when the internet came out, I, I um, on, on YouTube, there's Dr. Franz 30 MBA on iTunes. There's Dr. Franz 30 day MBA. And there's even another one I did uh, virtues of profitable dentistry, but I love it because it's like geometry. Like a lot of people say, well, well, you made that 98. Why are you, you know, who would listen to that now? And I said, well, I got the Pythagorean theorem. That was 500 BC. Should we just throw away geometry because it's now too damn old? I mean, who wants to play with a 2,500 year old right angle? And uh, so, um, and these young kids will say, 
wow, everything you're talking about, it's still late. Yeah, because people are people. Time is time. Money is money. I, I don't see how it's really going to change. And uh, so that's out there. So, you know, when you're out there in, in school, and I, I look at the internet reports, people are spending uh, something like on the average Facebook user is on Facebook like three and a half hours a day. Dude, come on. I mean, you, you got the 30 day, it's 30 hours. Get that because when you open up your own business and you have the knowledge, imagine doing your first root canal with no training. And that's what business is. I mean, if your instructor's new business of dentistry, they wouldn't be in a dental school. Uh, they're in a dental school as a, as a, you know, a refugee from free enterprise capitalism, which is brutal. It's survival of fitness. It's very brutal. So, so if you want to be an owner operator and I want you to be an owner operator because number one, one, I know my my homies. I mean, if you want to have a million employees, uh, be the army where everyone's under 21, be Walmart where 90% of your employees don't have a high school diploma. But my God, if you ever go into any dental school in America and you ask any dentist, what is the most number one problem with this dental school? They go, oh, the politics are intense. You can't get two dentists to agree that today's Monday. Uh, they'll say, no, well, in Australia, it's already Tuesday. So, so you will decide very quickly, do you just want to throw in the towel and take orders? Or do you want to give orders. Well, if you're going to give orders, that's called an owner operator. And the average dental specialist makes 320. Average general dentist makes 197. Average dentist who owns their own practice makes 244. And the average dentist who's employee makes 147. Where's the other hundred thousand dollars? Obviously a return to, uh, to the investors who have capital employed in dental office, which again, their math is wrong. The, the ADA even says, well, the average overhead in dentistry is 65%. I'm like, so the, so, so, okay, well, if I, um, is the other 35% profit? They go, yeah, the overhead 65%. So he makes 35% profit. And I said, so he's a volunteer dentist. Then. So he's just volunteering dentistry and the business makes 35%. See the peanut butter and jelly accounting. I have dentists at work in my office for 25% of production. So I pay myself 25% of production. So 25% of the production that I produce is my money from being a dentist. That's the value of being a dentist in Phoenix in 2020. Thank you, the Dr. Four, Hearn. The 14% profit is from having capital employed in Dell office. That was my point. Uh, well, thank you so much. Um, it's been so fast. You're right. I didn't really have to you take over. You're so good at doing this. Um, I did want to give you a couple comments from people. Um, some a librarian in the audience said that they really enjoyed your concept of talking about selling the invisible, which actually made me think too, because we do a lot of that. People don't see what we do and it's there. So that that's an interesting concept to, to think about. And so you're a great business person. It's so interesting hearing you speak. And then um, from a faculty member mentioned, and I, I was thinking this too, as you were saying this, I the faculty member said, I teach for the joy of it while I still practice. I am David Tukowski who wrote the last chat. Oh. So he, he just wanted to let you know who he is. But yes, we have faculty who, most of the faculty actually are adjunct. So they are in practice. So the students do benefit from a lot of practicing dentists. Um, but and, we, it, and we got two dental schools in my backyard. We got AT Still and Mesa and Midwestern Glendale. And I have 20 friends that work there one day a week and they only do it because they love it. And the only thing that drives and almost quit is all the, the staff and the meetings and the bureaucracy and all that stuff. They, they just do it for their love. And uh, they always celebrate, look, I'm here for fun. You guys battle that out. And they always joke, they go, well, the, the reason the battles are so intense is because the stakes are so low. Well, I, I, I will conclude with the Dean of our dental school. He was had his own, own couple practices, I believe, very successful, came back. And I think it is to give back. It's to, you know, further dentistry. And and I see that you, you're doing that in private practice and, and the faculty here are doing that in, in, in the schools. And um, but thank that you for sharing. Be, that would be a great podcast. Do it again. You're the moderator between me and the Dean. Oh, my God, that would be. It would, would be interesting. Do you know our Dean? Um, um, hang on Mark one second, University, uh, um, University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, um, um, and Sly, God, that's a hard one to spell. It's like Albuquerque. Uh, <laughs> well, we can talk about it later, but no, yeah, I, I'm, I'm Googling. it's Mark Wolf. Yeah. Let me see, um, my communiques with, uh, Mark Wolf and, um, Mark Wolf, Mark S. Wolf. What's the S stand for? Mark Scott. Mark Steven? I might be Steven, but we can do this offline because we are needing to conclude this. If you have oh, any we're, still, we're still going live? We are live right oh, now. Oh, I didn't yes. know we were live. I thought it was a personal conversation. No, Sorry, no. So if you want to oh, conclude. Oh, absolutely. I know him. That guy's a legend. 
Yes. He's a legend. And he's got a PhD in oral biology. Yeah, that would be a great. I see that you're using your database, which librarians use every day. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And and now uh, maybe we can pursue that other avenue also. And you gave us a lot of insight to dentistry and and the business of it and and the world around it. So thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing. I mean, uh, uh, three years at Creighton University. You know, the only memory I have from Creighton is every single night. I'd hear the same thing every night. It was 10 till midnight. I go, ding, the library will be closing in 10 minutes. And then you walk into Swanson Hall and there's all this drinking. It's all male. It's all filled with women and beer and cakes. And I'll never forget going to complain to Father um, McGloin, the 86 year old Jesuit priest. And I was telling him that I'm paying $6,000 a year for this. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not an institute of learning. Why isn't the library 24 hours a day oh, no. and, why, and all this stuff? And here's an 86-year-old Jesuit priest who gets up from behind his desk, walks around, puts his arm around me and says, Howard, maybe at midnight you should have a beer. And I thought, (laughs) man, dentists are so whacked out that Jesuits have to tell them to party harder. I mean, that's how weird dentists are. Uh, So I love the library. It's it's amazing. And uh, and, um, tell tell the gentleman that posted about – or asked about um, David Acker, that that would be a good question on Dentaltown because the neat thing about Dentaltown, you know, all the other social medias are just last in, first out. It's just built to engage you. But with a message board format like they have at, you know, NASA and Tesla and, and all the other places, it's it's on a um, it's on an exact um, index form. So you just go there and you just um, um, do a keyword for Acker, and it pulls up the one thread that we've been talking about forever and he should post on there so what's the final solution is it a known or are we gonna have to disagree that we'll we'll never really know but that was a big changing thing in dental history and uh, we we should know about that yeah no definitely and 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 thank you for mentioning dental sound it's a great forum and and especially for students once they graduate i found that it's super useful for people to share information and evidence but thank you again for today i appreciate it and um i know everyone we're getting a lot of good responses so thank you and um, have a good afternoon all right thank you so much for having me on the program